Welcome back! Let me begin with a joke, which we can see right now on the Bartle's Cosmic Grey page. I don't know how to explain in a different way this huge black rectangle which is placed right now over spaceship Earth graph. Especially when we look at the bottom chart, which is still visible nicely, although it was not updated for last two days. Thankfully, I've saved the image when it was still ok, so you can admire those angry dots anyway. Notice the huge fluctuations of cosmic ray density, which was jumping from 9200 to 10400. Similar increase is visible as well on other graphs. This data comes from McMurdo station. Earth is clearly bombarded by energetic particles of non-solar origin. During last two days solar activity was low, what means that Earth started to be influenced stronger by the low energy field. What is visible on readings from ground magnetometers, where daily geomagnetic disturbances reached more than 200 nanoteslas. And is still growing. However, the latest jolt recorded in Norway is different, as it took place at different time and was recorded only in station close to Northern Pole. Only way to connect it with solar activity is to look at ACE magnetic field readings, where we can see some fluctuations of IMF orientation, but those shifts match with the disturbances only partially. While we still look at IMF readings, it is worth to mention the crossing of a sector boundary which took place on September 22. Earth moved from negative region of heliosphere to a part with positive current flow. However, the elevated flux of high energy protons visible on ACE and GOES readings has nothing to do with it. It was most likely caused by this backside eruption. Some unusual 5.5 magnitude quake took place in Reykjanes Ridge at 19.18 UTC on 23rd of September. By coincidence, before it happened the concentration of nitrogen oxide was visibly increased right above the epicenter. Just as during most of seismic activities in this region, there was a reconnection of an open magnetospheric field line right at the time of quake. open field line turned into closed red one. Now some unusual weather. Look at this enormous low pressure system which appeared over northern Pacific and which is now closing to northern America. The pressure in the middle of this system is reaching 988 hectopascals. Looks scary.
Now something what you probably were waiting for. Time to play with my new toy. Today I will use another Visbart feature. Simulation of magnetospheric field lines. To turn it on we need to use specific data. Tsiganenko simulation seems to work correctly only when we use this dataset. OMNI2 HO MRG 1 hour. Problem is that it wasn't updated since 11th of September, so I can't show you the last G3 geomagnetic storm. Anyway, I turn it on the latest version of Tsinagenko model, which allows me to use variable ACE readings updated automatically from the OMNI servers. This is how the result looks like. Yellow bar represents our main magnetic axis. I will show you the magnetic field on 20th of August, during the passage of solar flux tube, as I've made a CCMC model run for this event, and I will be able to compare the magnetic field lines with MHD simulation. But for now, notice that the field lines seem to stick out from area placed at some distance from the magnetic poles. I can give you two explanations. Simulation doesn't work correctly or at this time our magnetic poles were actually dislocated. To learn which answer is correct, I will have to use some external data, which is not connected with NASA or satellite readings. Of course, I mean the ground magnetometer stations and the daily geomagnetic jolts, which were recorded on 20th of August. Let's see if there is some connection between magnetosphere simulation and the jolt which was recorded in Northern Europe and Russia, around first UTC. As we can see, at this time, open magnetosphere field lines were clearly connected to those regions. But this is not all. Look at those areas, marked in white. Two groups of open field lines originated over Northern Hemisphere, in East-West orientation. Sounds familiar? I will go even further and call them polar cusps, areas where solar wind particles are capable to enter the ionosphere. Ok, time to see if the Tsiganenko magnetic field model will be capable to explain another geomagnetic jolt which took place couple hours later, just after 6 UTC, on another continent, and was recorded in Fort Churchill station in Canada. But here things are getting harder as we won't find anything until we won't add some additional data. Those arrows represent readings made by Timis E satellite, recorded around the time of geomagnetic jolt. Bright blue ones 
show the direction and strength of magnetic field. Darker ones show the velocity of ions and direction of their flow. It seems that the simulated magnetic field adjusts itself especially for the satellites which pass in close distance from Earth. Field lines marked by me in white were not visible until I didn't add the TIMIS data. As you can see, both field lines are closed ones. And by coincidence, one of them is connected right in the area where the geomagnetic jolt was recorded at this time. For some unknown reason, part of the most crucial data is missing. But I can continue with the rest. Notice that the directions of ions flow seem to be very unstable and in some points vectors placed next to each other can point in totally different directions. <laughs> Yellow are especially interesting as they point almost in opposite directions. It can be explained only if we will assume that those two closed field lines have opposite magnetic orientation. However, it would mean that over northern hemisphere they are connected to opposite magnetic poles where both were located over Northern America. Guess if it's supposed to be like this. Ok, now it's time for some really strange readings. Look what happened with the magnetic field vectors soon after. Notice as well the clear response of ions, which were visibly affected by the magnetic disturbance.
Whatever caused it, it wasn't only a single event, as all Timmy's satellites which passed through this area recorded the same thing. As the magnetic field simulation doesn't give us any clues, it is the best time to check the magnetohydrodynamics. But it seems that you will have to wait for it till the next episode, as there are some significant events which I have to show you in first order, because I'm probably the only guy on this planet who is not afraid to tell how badly screwed our planet is currently. Those of you who follow the comment section on my channel won't be surprised by this chart, but I am still amazed that no one besides me didn't notice this enormous geomagnetic jolt, which was recorded by Canadian magnetometers on 24th of September. But let's take a closer look. Notice that the disturbance was much stronger at mid-latitudes than in polar regions, where it wasn't recorded almost at all. It is a clear sign that this event wasn't caused by any solar activity. I show you the readings from Mianuk station. Here you can see that the jolt reached minus 400 nanoteslas of total magnitude. Very strong at such big distance from the northern pole. Here you can compare it with the last G3 geomagnetic storm. The K index reached 6 points during the jolt, while G3 storm reached maximum value of 5. Now look at the AE readings from Kyoto site. On 24th, the jolt reached 1500 nanoteslas. Almost 500 more than during the G3 storm. And those are the readings from different stations placed around the planet at similar latitudes. As you can see, this jolt was a local, not a global event. It seems that the event which caused this jolt was recorded by all Timmy's satellites which orbit the Earth. Crafts which orbit the Moon at the second hand didn't notice anything unusual besides the daily disturbances. Although Timmy's data is not completely updated, we can see how the event affected the readings of P3 and P4 satellites.
As you can see, the spinning magnetic field vectors were visibly disturbed. At the same time, P4 satellite recorded a clear shift of magnetic orientation. The shift was connected with a clear drop of ion's temperature. Magnetic disturbance was recorded as well by GeoTail satellite. Anyway, similar disturbance took place three days later, on September 27. Both events caused the elevation of KP index. It seems that the strength of those sudden geomagnetic jolts is somehow connected with the disturbances on GOES graphs. Yes, there was a geomagnetic disturbance on 25th as well. For the end, I will show you some long-term observations of geomagnetic field. Those are the readings from Lerwick Observatory, starting from 1923 till 2013. Look at the strength of magnetic Y component. It started from minus 3955. After less than a century, the value dropped to minus 592. Quite a difference. And with this information, I end this delayed episode. Class dismissed. Be safe. Peace.